Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Online with the CMC, a global journey cataloging world languages. Sarah Miku Kershaw, um, our IHL CMC intern, and Mary Cornell will be presenting today. Take it away, ladies. Hi, good morning. Hello, all. Our presentation today for Online with the CMC is a global journey cataloging world languages. I'm Sarah Miku Kersha, and my co-presenter is Mary Cornell. Today's agenda includes who we are, fields to remember, tools to utilize, some record examples, and our list of resources. Hi, I'm Sarah Miku Kersha. I'm an intern at the Cataloging Maintenance Center. I'm a grad student at the University of Denver, getting my master's in library science. I'm nearly done with my program and will continue to work in academic libraries post-graduation. I'm relatively new to cataloging and very new to cataloging global, global languages, but it's been awesome to learn from Mary. I'm from California, but currently living in Arizona with my husband and our cat baby Tilly. I love to read fantasy and sci-fi fiction, travel, and trying new restaurants. Hello all, my name is Mary Cornell. I'm a cataloger here at the Cataloging Maintenance Center. I've worked here for almost a year and a half. As this is a webinar about world languages, I feel it's pertinent to know my cataloging and other experience in world languages, as well as, as language knowledge. I've taken academic coursework in Spanish, personal study of Italian, and my indexing work with Family Search has included Spanish, German, Italian, Afrikaans, and some French. While working at Ingram, I catalog works in Spanish frequently, but at the CMC, I have also cataloged works in French, Vietnamese, Arabic, Korean, Persian, and German, to name a few. Look forward to cataloging more. Personally, I am a movie nerd, real life hobbit, amateur photographer, travel enthusiast, and cat mom to my tuxie Merlin. And just in case anyone is curious, the picture on the bottom right is from the National Botanical Gardens in Dublin, Ireland. First up, we wanted to look at some fields to remember while cataloging world languages. Per RDA, these fields on any item should be transcribed as found on an item. Also, you will find if you search in RDA as we did, that each one of these fields also has a rule about transliteration and how that should be cataloged. For instance, when looking at the 100 field per RDA 8.4, when cataloging world languages, we should record names in the language and script in which they appear on the sources from which they are taken. And catalogers, uh, and as catalogers, we should also, if applicable, record a transliterated form of the name either as a substitute for or in addition to the form as that appears on the source. For a quick example, let's go to the next slide. This is the title page for one of the volumes of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire on the right. And on the left, we have a field that represents what you see in the OCLC record for the book. As you can see, J.K. Rowling's name is listed on this title page two different ways. Firstly, it's listed in English, but also at the bottom, there is a mixture of Romanized English and her last name written in Korean, listing her as the author. In a situation like this, as a cataloger, per the RDA rule listed in the last slide, this does come down to cataloger's judgment. You could, as a cataloger, list Rowling's name in the 100 and the 245 as written on the page because transcribe. You could also still transliterate her name and put the Korean script of her name in the 100 as shown here, and then a Romanized Latin version of her name in the second 100. Then, but then what do you do with the English script of her name on the title page? You could do as we did and record it additionally in the second 245. We feel RDA leaves this field with a level of interpretation. That is why this was cataloged as it was. 
When cataloging world language items, the 41 and 546 fields are two fields that work together in the record. These items are most commonly used for translations, but can also be used for bilingual items and items with more than two languages in an item. In the example above, we have the 41 and the 546 for the Korean translation of New Moon by Stephanie Meyer. As shown in the first field on the top, the 41, with an indicator of 1, shows that this is a translation. The subfield A shows that this item is in Korean, and the subfield H shows that the item was written, originally written in English. A 546 should correspond with this 41, and as it relays, this item is in Korean, translated from English. Another consideration we would like to mention is link, the linking of paired fields. As you saw in our Harry Potter example from the previous slide, there was a set of 100 paired fields and a set of 245 paired fields. Let's look at another example here. At the bottom, uh, we, have a, we have part of the record for a Korean translation of Divergent by Veronica Roth. At the top, we've inserted what it looks like on the left when the two fields are unlinked, and on the right, we've added what it looks like when the paired fields are linked. According to OCLC, if you put in a set of paired fields when the non-Latin script in the first field and the Latin script in the second field, as shown above, the two fields should link automatically. Let's say they don't. In the bottom screenshot, and apologies that it's a bit small, um, we show you that you can right click on the top par paired field and go down to click the option to link fields. Or if you need to say edit something in one of the paired fields, you can also unlink fields as well. We will include the link about this process in our resources slide. Lastly, for this section, we wanted to look at some series fields for a bilingual book. This book is about Ha Mulan and is a bilingual book in simplified Chinese and English published in 2012. The fields we're looking at here are the series fields. Now, we will admit this was an enhanced record, so there were, all, so there were some other catalogers' decisions that had already been made about how this item was cataloged that we had to decide, do we keep it or do we update it? The series does appear on the book as is in the record with the Chinese language series first and the English language series second. Considering we decided to keep the English language series in both 490 fields. In the 830, however, you can have only one subfield A field and therefore we chose to include only the Chinese language series form and the romanized version of the series because it appears first on the volume. Next, we're gonna talk about some tools that the CMC has utilized to catalog world languages that could be useful for your world languages cataloging as well. First step is the tool LexiLogos, a tool with dictionaries for over 150 languages. Most languages also include additional resources such as other dictionaries, common phrase books, etc. This tool can also be utilized for the keyboard function that many languages have available, as well as some languages have a Latin conversion option. In the example shown, a cataloger typed in a translation of a Korean title and the LexiLogos keyboard translated in Latin letters back into the Korean Hangul script. The second word of the title has been typed in, and when the cataloger presses enter, or spaces, the next word should convert into the script as well. We as catalogers at the CMC utilize the keyboards you find in different tools this way to check on Latin conversions of words, titles, etc. To continue, our next recommendation and one of the resources we've utilized is Google Translate. We are sure that any of you who have cataloged word languages have utilized this resource, but we did feel we would be remiss if our presentation did not mention it. It is one of the most accessible free resources for cataloging world languages that we've encountered. Often, we at the CMC use it as a beginning resource to help us identify languages on an item. It also has features such as translation history, where you can link the Google Translate app, on your phone or device with your Google account on your computer. 
For instance, if we were to flip the screenshot above, it could have come from a picture of the author's name from the item, but the photo is a screenshot from a cataloger's translation history on their desktop version of Google Translate. Another important resource is the Library of Congress, which offers currently over 75 romanization tables for world languages that catalogers can use. These tables look at a language's alphabet, value usage, diacritics, rules of usage, notes, etc. The example shown looks at the first page of the Arabic romanization table, showing the Arabic letters in different positions in a word, how they romanize, and some rules about vowels and diphthongs. We have a full link for all the tables and resources at the end of this presentation. Next, we're going to do a quick look at a couple of resources we've used to assist us. First, we have the National Institute of Korean Language through the Republic of Korea. This is a resource that is a bit more specialized. We at the CMC have utilized this resource to assist in our understanding of how to romanize Korean and transcribe it properly. It's been a very helpful resource as you would imagine. If nothing else, the specific section that explains and works through romanization is what might be a helpful section for other catalogers. Also, we wanted to mention the resource tied to English. We found this resource recently while cataloging items for the Illinois State University Library. The pictured example shows the translation from a Thai word language materials 264 subfield A. As you can see, Thai to English broke down the translation multiple ways. It created a transliteration, a phonetic version, and then also translated the word. And the last resource we've used is mylanguages.org. LexiLogos does not have an option currently to assist in romanizing Persian. In searching for assistance in this, when we at the CMC were cataloging a resource for the Illinois Heartland Institute Library, we came across this tool. It does not offer as many options nor outside resources like LexiLogos, but as with other world languages cataloging, it was helpful as a secondary tool. What it can also do that we have not seen another tool offer is what it calls a cleanup of romanization. This is where you feed through the initial translation of the world language that was romanized and try to create a cleaner version of that translation. You can see above in the picture that a word was fed through the cleanup process and we were given what is considered a clear translation of the word. Next, we are going to look at some rec record examples for some world language items that the CMC has cataloged. Here, we have an example of a translation for the book, Looking for Alaska, translated into German by John Green, Ein wei Alaska, that was cataloged from Monticello Middle School. There's a picture of the item on the left, and on the right, we have some fields, some of the fields shown. We see the 041 noting in subfield A that the item is in German and a translation by the code in the first indicator of one. And in subfield H, we have the original language code of English. Next, we have the example of Midnight Sun by Stephanie Meyer, translated into Korean, cataloged for Centennial High School. There were a couple intriguing elements about this item. Firstly, the book was split into two volumes. Also, what we thought were cool was that, is that these books had artwork that was unique to the editions. Looking at the fields in our example on the left, you see the translator in the original Korean Hangul script in the first 700, and then there's the translator's name in Romanized Italian, or sorry, Romanized Latin script in the second 700. In the third 700, there is a note about the language of the work as a translation from Korean, an expression of the original English language work, and a selection. This is part two of two. Lastly, there are two 800 fields representing the series, the first representing the series in the original Korean Hangul script, and the second, the romanization of the script. The next few slides will be for a children's collection that we recently received from the Illinois State University Library. 
The first in this collection is a Serbian book with a title that loosely translated as The Cat and the Rooster. It tells the story of a cat and rooster who are best friends living in a forest when the rooster is kidnapped by a wily fox. In the record on the right, you'll see in the, the three fields I could find on the book that were in Serbian that could be transcribed and linked beyond the 700. Google Translate struggled with this because, as you see, the text in the title is a bit stylized versus the author at the top, and so it was having trouble deciphering what language is this. Thank goodness for title pages. This book was published in Egypt by the publisher Al Marif in Arabic. It tells the story of a young chick who is separated from its mother while it's still in its egg. A combination of Google Translate, Lexilingos, and the romanization table for Arabic were utilized in cataloging this book. On the right is the fantastic cover art for this book. On the left, you can see in the 245, we have the transliteration of the title in Arabic. There is also included the publication information in the 264 in Arabic and also Latin script. Published in Athens by IK. Papadou Poulou and Son around 1959. This book in Greek looks at a young village girl and her dog tending to her farm animals and imagining another life. Shown in our example from the record on the right, we have the 100 field on the top with the original Greek author transcribed and the second 100 with the romanization. Next is the 245 with the title, author, and illustrator. Notice that the text leading into the illustrator is a mixture of upper and lower case letters. This is one of the rare instances until the plot of a story starts where you see it, this in the book. Then in the 264 includes place of publication in the original Greek and then romanized in the, two, in the second 264 publisher. And lastly, in an unsure date, an unsure date of publication because the only date listed in the book is the donation date. Our last example of the presentation, according to a note on the inside cover, is an adaptation of the story, Down Down the Mountain. This note was a written note though, so I did not include it in the record. We could not find it anywhere in the book. Granted, the story tells of a young boy who lives on the mountain with his grandparents, and they come down from the mountain to conduct business, etc. The cover for this book is on the right of our slide. These example of our fields on the left show the author listed first on the cover of our book. This book included different authorship on the title and cover, title page and cover. We included both in the Thai script in the 100 and the Latin script in the second 100. And the first 245, we have the Thai script, including the title, both authors and the illustrator. And then the second 245 includes the Latin script. Lastly, we have the assumed place of publication, which is found via the place of printing in the 264. Places of publication and the date of publication in Thai script in the first 264 and in the Romanized Latin in the second 264. Here we have listed the resources we have talked about and utilized for our presentation. Lastly, from the CMC on the call today are myself, Sarah Miku Kershaw, Dr. Pamela Thomas, Mary Cornell, Eric McKinley, Kat Anderberg, Blake Walter, Katie Roberts, and Andrea Joysta. And do we have any questions? Mary, we do. Um, and I've allowed everybody to unmute themselves if they want to ask their question out loud to the entire group. Um, so for our first question we have from Blake, I'm wondering about the example of the Greek children's fiction. Should the transliterated 100 still be in all caps? So uh, Sarah and I actually talked about this a bit. And the reason why we decided to keep it in all caps was because when you change the letters from capitals to lowercase, it changes what the meaning of the word is. Um, and we looked at that and we actually played with it a little bit. I played with it when I cataloged another Greek book as well, um, because sometimes when the letters are lowercase, they change. Um, 
with different letters in the alphabet. So, um, and I, I did that with the other Greek book I cataloged as well. So that's why we decided to keep it in uppercase. Um, so yeah, that was that was a bit of a struggle to make that decision, but it was a purposeful one. Thank you for that question though, it's a good one. Okay, we also have a question from Shelley. In the O40 subfield B field, are you cataloging in English or the original language? So I, we are cataloging in English technically. Um, so the book is in another language. So say it's in Greek or it's in Arabic or whatnot, but we are cataloging in English. So, you know, our 3XX fields are English, our 520s are English. Um, everything else is English other than what we're transcribing. So technically, yes, the record is in English. My okay. name is Brian. I'm um, from the ELA library. And I'm wondering, um, how do you work through the stylized types of different languages? You mentioned that uh, Google was having trouble identifying um, some of the scripts and that, but how are you trying to enter in that information or how do you identify um, what to actually enter in order to make a translation work? Okay. So say the Serbian book was that example that I mentioned. So it was a lot of back and forth. So comparing the cover page and the title page and making sure that the script lined up um, because it was a little more style. And I run into this a lot between a title page and a cover page where say what you're finding on the title page versus the cover page is a little bit more stylized. And so you're sitting there and you're doing a comparison. Um, a lot of times what I will do is I'll sit there and I'll make those comparisons, but luckily most of the time you're finding either on a title page or a cover page that it's different. Like say on a, a title page, it's a little bit more stylized, but they've taken the time on, or on a cover page, it's a little bit more stylized, but on a title page, they've taken the time to say, either if it's an older book, like that Serbian book was, they've taken the time to write it a little bit more carefully or consistently, or say if it's on a newer book, it's been typed versus um, an artist rendering it. And so that tends to help quite a bit when you're cataloging something um, because your camera can capture something that's got a bit more spacing to it. Um, yes, yeah, so Mary, you're using your your phone. Yes, I'm using my phone a lot and, of times. And taking a picture and, yes. and then uploading that to Google Translate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But then I also I'm finding other resources where I find the alphabet. Right. And I can sit there and I can do comparisons to what I have in front of me on a title page and parse that out as well. Cause I don't ever just rely on Google Translate because no. <laughs> it's it's not a perfect tool. No. It's not. So that's also um, what really helps me a lot is I'll, I'll also find the alphabet and I'm sitting there doing comparisons to what I have in front of me. Um, so definitely utilize your tools. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, that was a long answer, but it's, it's never, it's complicated when you have something like that, so. Yeah, and, it, and sometimes I find that even on the title page, things are staying stylized in that. So that's, that's true. That's true. So sometimes yeah. I'll even look at the title page for so as well. And you might find something there is also. And I'm sorry to labor the point, but how do you use your camera to and download it into Google Translate? I think my colleague has tried that and she hasn't been very successful. Okay. So um, what I have found is, oh, um, so I have Google Docs as an app or Google Translate as an app on my phone. And then I, I'm signed in to Google Translate on my computer. Um, and so you have to have it set up between your app on your phone and on your computer to um, sync your translation history. Um, 
I had I had to learn to do that. But if you can if you sync your translation history, it will sync between your app and your desktop. Mary, do you have those like instructions written like in a Word doc that maybe you I could do upload? not, but okay. I can. Okay, maybe you can upload that to L, to the L two event yep. too. Yep, absolutely. That would be helpful. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Um, were you finished? Oh, some some stuff on that point. Um, another simpler or what I used is if you have an iPhone and you go to your photos and you like kind oh, of it's on yeah. a word like you would to highlight it, a translation option does come up. And so sometimes that's a good starting point as well. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, we've got a few more questions uh, from Juanita. For translated works, how important is the 240? It wasn't on your list, but several examples did have the field. So we did, this is actually something we talked about a couple of days ago um, here in the CMC. And so I didn't list that because there was some talk amongst us here at the CMC about whether or not that's something through RDA that might be slowly being phased out. Um, we haven't found anything for sure about whether or not that is going to be phased out, but um, what I'm finding in a lot of OCLC records is that the reliance is to use the 700 more and to include um, container of expression or container of work or something like that, depending on what exactly you're cataloging. For me, the way I was taught to catalog both languages, you do also include the 240. Um, but that's something that I need to do a little bit more research on personally. So. Okay, um, we've got another, um, I guess, comment from Blake. Um, an invaluable resource that I have used more than once is the Facebook group Troublesome Catalogers and Magical Metadata yes. Fairies. I have posted yes. pictures of covers, title pages yes. for non English items, and I've always received helpful feedback from knowledgeable catalogers familiar yeah. with that language. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, that's an group. awesome group. Yep. 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 Yeah. Um, I've got a question um, on the Hua Milan. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, could you have added another um, 830 field with the English series title? Since I know the subfield A is not repeatable, but the 830 field is. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could have. I okay. could have. Yeah, I didn't think about it, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got another question from Shelly. When transcribing, do you copy and paste from some of your online resources into the MARC record? Mm. Well, I'm assuming you're probably copying and pasting the title, right? Or not? from Google Translate or whatever, or Lexi Logos or one of the other resources or no? I try I try not to with okay. the non-Latin script because sometimes there are issues. Right. Um, Copy and pasting into OCLC is not always a, yes, a yeah, good thing. <laughs> no, no, and cause, especially because sometimes there are issues with the diacritics too, mm -hmm. like that doesn't come through properly. So a lot of times what I'll end up doing is I'll copy and paste into a Word doc first mm -hmm. and maybe take out the diacritics that's usually what i end up doing is taking out the diacritics um if you do paste you if you paste unformatted a lot of times um yeah you get better results just that's yeah. just a little tip for me yeah because then you can go in and there are um i always just know it is control e i'm sorry i don't know what it's properly called in oclc <laughs> but there is a proper table in oclc where you can go in and add in the diacritics for oh, different the diacritics language, table yep the yep. diacritics table for different languages and i'd much rather use that um versus grabbing it from whatever tool i'm using online okay so yeah 
All right. Um, Shelly says, thanks. Uh, Tan V says, I Google the name or ISBN of the book and search that in images and click click and visit that site and you can click on picture on the picture and it translates the title page or whatever mm. images you get in your search mm. okay. yeah that's true it will do that it will do that yeah um does anybody else have any questions um we are going to be uh, meeting soon <laughs> to discuss <laughs> uh, what topics we're going to cover starting um, in august through next may um, so we would really love to cover things that you guys want us to, to talk about. So if you could put either in the chat or if you could um, email us, and I'll put our email address, what at cmc at illinoisheartland.org. Um, not that we can't come up with some fabulous topics, but um, yeah, Mary, uh, uh, serials cataloging, I know that's a, that's a hot topic. Um, Actually, we're, um, we just met uh, and discussed offering some two-week classes on Moodle, um, and my goal is to have a two-week uh, serials cataloging class on Moodle in November, Mary, but um, we could also do an online with the CMC. We don't mind um, saturating your brains with uh, the same information, so to speak. Um, and Mary, will um, are the slides up right now? Uh, the ones without notes are yep. yes so after yep. the presentation mary will upload the slides with the notes and um, possibly add that document on how to uh, use google oh, translate no. i also have the evaluation form um sorry i know i'm working on <laughs> something better um, so basically with the evaluation form it's a word doc it's in the l2 event you'll have to like download it to your computer um, save it, you know, fill it out, save it, and email it to me. And I'm sorry, it's so dumb. <laughs> I wish it were better. Um, okay, so Lori says we're building a collection of books in Ukrainian. Anyone have any hints or tips for finding bib info for them if they're not in OCLC? Well, Lori, um, the CMC can also catalog those for free for you if um, if you consider them to be a special collection. So, um, my just, question, my question back to you, Lori, is how new are the books? Mm. Um, and this is just my experience. You could always see if you can find the publisher for them. Um, because I, I, I don't know. I mean, Spanish, Spanish publishers, Spanish language publishers are really good. Ooh. Oh, so Lori says no donations. They're new from what used to be Russia House. Russia House. Okay. Oh. Maybe could you maybe send us some um, cover or title pages and we could look at them? Oh, and then Nancy says that you can send them to Rails for the World Language Cataloging Services if they're in your regular collection. Um, Josh says, I know when working with books in Farsi, I had to hunt down the publishers, email them, and just hope I got a response. Usually I didn't. Josh. That's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, because I, I, one of the books in the Illinois, um, sorry, Illinois State University's library was from russia house as well and so when you said that i was like oh gosh <laughs> and Juanita says you can google translate the publisher's website to start so thanks yeah Juanita. that's also true that's also true and i've done that as well with a couple of publishers and Lori says thanks so much for the suggestions i'm excited about this new collection yeah it sounds really cool yeah Okay, does anybody else have any questions? You can put them in the chat or you can um, verbally ask them if you can 
unmute yourself. So Nancy says, I use one specific translator other than Google Translator Stars 21, and she's got the link there. Mm. It is absolutely free, but it is no means perfect. It has ads and pop-ups and can be confusing. But once you've chosen the original language that you are translating from the keyboard icon, will open the second window. You may have to enable pop-ups allowing you to insert characters by clicking on them individually with the mouse. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. Always love new resources. So yeah, we're very much appreciate that. Is, yeah. <laughs> It's complicated. Yep. 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 Especially if you don't speak the language. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Um, just a reminder um, next month, April 9th, um, Linda John Johnson, one of the share catalogers, is going to be talking about a stitch in time basic or budget book repair. And I've seen. Um, the beginning of her presentation. It's very awesome. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, and then May 11th, um, Mary is going to be um, presenting on the treasure trove of the past, digging into cataloging local history. And then that will be the end of our FY 2023 um, online with the CMCs. And like I said, we're looking for topics. Um, we're meeting next week. So send them to us. Um, soon, please, if, if there's something you really want us to cover, um, either as online with a CMC and or as a course in Moodle, because we are always open for suggestions. Okay, not seeing any other questions or comments. Um, thank you, Mary and Sarah. That was an awesome presentation, and I'm glad that uh, there are others who can do this work because that is not in my wheelhouse. Um, we just have a bunch of thank yous. I'm going to um, stop the recording.